great to be here. And it's really, it's a fabulous exhibition, so I really do congratulate the um, curators. And it's really great to be here and to be seeing them again, because it's actually been a good 10 years more, really, since I published um, Stravinsky's Lunch, when really my head for the decade before that had been full of practically nothing else than the paintings you see down there and the, um, the artists there. So coming back to them again, and I'd always rather gone off Stravinsky's Lunch and thought it was far too much in the first person and really didn't like it, but actually I've had to reread a bit of it to do tonight, and it's not nearly as bad as I saw, so I'm <laughs> pleased to be able to report. Um, what probably will strike you when you go down and look at it is how many images of women there are and how many women there are who are the artists, how many images are by the women. And one of the things I want to talk about tonight is about that period and those artists as a kind of really important moment in... Um, the sort of changes that came in the lives of women in Australia. Um, changes that were important and in some ways lay a ground for the lives that many of us have had, uh, well, really since, but also hard won and not always secure. Um, I came to these artists through the writers of the same period, that period between the wars, and I came to them as a young woman when I arrived here from Papua New Guinea where I'd gone with my American um, anthropology husband, far too young, we were far too young to be married, a really nice man, we were really good friends, but we married ludicrously young for both of us. So I ended up here on the other side of the world having grown up in England thinking, help, <laughs> what do I do, what is this country, what, what, where am I? And I read my way along the Australian literature shelves of the ANU library where I was and found all those women from that period between the wars who were, many of them, those first women sort of experimenting in writing with modernism and with ways of living in a way that was kind of breaking through the old, old constraints so that you could have an intellectual life. I mean, women had, obviously, before, but there were ways in which one could be much more prominent within a national discourse, as those women were. And from them, I discovered the artists. So it was by reading and by looking that I learned about this country that I've come so much to love and despair of and hope for and all the things one does with the place one lives in the complex modern world we live in. Now, of course, the thing that really defines this period at the beginning is the First World War. And the sort of brutal fact that so many men were killed, the proportion of men who were being killed in that war within the population was kind of horrendously enormous. So to put it at its most basic, um, the, young, the women who were coming into their 20s, coming into being young women in the, at the time of the First World War and after it, many of them were unable to marry, just simply numerically. So that was, I think, a kind of a trigger for a lot of this, that it was, a po it was a time of kind of anxiety and also of possibility. And one of my most favorite paintings in this exhibition, and kind of anywhere, I mean, in, in, um, of all Australian art, is Grace Cottington Smith's The Soft Knicker, Knitter, which many of you will know and is in this exhibition. And it's almost, it belongs to the gallery here. It's very often when it's not touring, it's almost always um, exhibited. And whenever I come to the gallery, I always go and pay her to visit. Now, what it is, it's, um, has, it's been, it is the first post-impressionist painting painted in Australia by Grace Cutting Smith, who was a young woman at the time, and it's of her sister Madge knitting socks, or knitting, and presumably knitting for the war. She's knitting in a kind of rough, a rough um, wool. Now, Madge's story is a terrible story. 
a really terrible story. Um, I tell a bit of it in, in Stravinsky's Lunch, but she basically longed to marry. She was quite a conservative girl who wanted the kind of conservative life, had um, subsequently went to England after the war. She was unable to go with her older sisters before the war when they went chaperoned on the kind of tour that was still possible before the war, delayed, went afterwards, falls in love with the curate, has to come back to look after her mother who's ailing. So her story is a sort of blighted story. It's a story of the kind of awful side of what happens in that era. Grace's, on the other hand, is a story of kind of enormous possibility. So there she was, one of these, this young woman from a conservative family up on the North Shore of Sydney, churchy family, lovely family. I think they really cleaved together and gave a very good kind of... Um, home to those children. She painted, I'll be painting at one time, drawing of the, called The Smile of Home, which was of a door, a lit door with one of the sisters standing in it when she was coming home. That was kind of what she went home to, and it was always a huge base for her, and she lived at Cossington, that house, uh, in, um, up in Taramara, until um, she, very close to when she died, had to go into a nursing home. So for her, this era opens up the possibility of an intellectual life, of a creative life, of an artistic life, and of being in a kind of moment of being able to be in the vanguard of what art did. And the way she was able to see really, I think, changed, um, really changed the way we see Australia. Or at least that's what um, I would say. And Daniel Thomas says this, and I think in a way, this um, exhibition says it. So it was an era for all these women of kind of hope and of possibility, but also an era when the sorts of, the ways they lived changed. And I came to looking at this because I was really interested in the way we deal as women, particularly those of us who are creative and have sort of intellectual lives and a strong life of the mind, is how does one put the life of the heart and the life of the mind together, love and art. I was in my 40s when I was doing this work, kind of time when sort of love and art can get you a bit. And um, yeah, it was very interesting just looking at the ways they dealt with that kind of con contradiction. So a lot of those women, one of the things that happened after the war was women were able to travel unchaperoned. Doesn't sound like very much, but it was huge. They could go to Europe, they could travel on their own, they could take a flat on their own. So people like Grace Crowley, who you'll see in, that, in this exhibition, Dorit Black, Evelyn Syme, Ethel Spowers, uh, many, and Dangar, they went and they worked and they studied in France and they studied in England. Um, and they were able to move around. And they all write of that period as a time of kind of enormous freedom. And when you look at this exhibition, it's just full of images of women sort of in a kind of a modern dress in um, pictures of people uh, with the, their work around them. There's one wall which has got uh, three paintings on it. One is Margaret Preston's um, painting of the flapper. One is Adelaide Perry's painting of a woman pilot, and the third one is Margaret Preston's self-portrait. And it's a fabulous wall. It was very cleverly, I think, put together, because there, in a way, is the kind of new way that women could be. You could be the stylish flapper, you could, what she calls the flapper, but stylish, well-dressed, and modern. And, or you could be the pilot, or there you could be the artist with her brushes. And, one of the things that they did is that they were adventurous. They didn't just paint. They made pottery. They did prints. They did woodblocks. They did fabrics. Um, a whole range of things. Furniture, interior design. is a fabulous um, recreation of one of the designs in, in the exhibition of a kind of in, a modern interior. It looks terribly uncomfortable. Wouldn't want to live in this at all, but it was kind of sort of interesting that they were thinking in ways in which you modern, you, you make art out of the life we, you live around and you create, um, you, you take that art, you, you kind of move it both ways so that your art goes isn't separate from life, isn't separate from art and craft, isn't separate from the fabrics and the furnitures and the chairs that we sit on. And I really have always enjoyed that sort of enormously and admired that about them. Um, in a way, they seem to me rather like 
as artists, rather like the, the writer Christina Stead, who's another really favorite of mine. And I'm just old enough, or rather I should say, I was then just young enough that I met some of them. I didn't meet, the only artist I met was Marcel Hinder, um, who was the widow of Frank Hinder, who I went to see um, in the last years of her life, and she told me a lot. She was a very close friend of Grace Crowley's and um, very interesting sort of way of thinking about what, also what happened to them, which I'll come to in, in a little while. Um, and Christina Stead, if any of you are familiar with her writing, may know the novel For Love Alone, which is such an interesting novel because it is, its idiom is, is modern, so it sort of has a very similar kind of idiom to the way in which these women were uh, writing. And it was one of the first novels I read when I was here in Sydney, wondering what to do, whether I was brave enough to go back to England and confess, or whether I was going to stay here and see what happened. Um, and she was talking about, she kind of, it was for love alone, and Teresa Hawkins, the character's entire motivation for life was love, to find love, the great love. And yet her horror was to settle for a marriage that would put her in one of the, of the suburbs that were growing out along the railway lines outside Sydney. So it's that sort of contest again, which has for so long, I think, interested me. And, for, and in a lot of ways, I think it's again represented here. Um, Margaret Preston's an interesting one. I, she, in that self-portrait of hers down there, she's sitting there with a little flower behind her and her brushes, and it's a very um, flat portrait with the flat wall behind her. So it's quite an, a very sort of interesting idiom. Um, and she said of it, I'm a flower painter, but I'm not a flower. Um, she was an interesting character because a lot of them had rather difficult, um, sometimes personal lives. They had, there were moments of great opportunity and the times to travel and they ran studios in George Street. A lot of kind of moments in which I think they found a sociality and a way of being and a way of being intellectual and a way of being creative. It was very satisfying. But I think they also found that there were some quite bruising aspects to uh, that contest between, or that conflict, or that um, ambiguity between the way one lives in heart and the way one lives in life. But Margaret Preston didn't. Now, she was amazing. She was very assertive. She, one of the things I'll talk about in a second, which I think is really interesting, is how a lot of these artists came into the gallery. Her work came in very early, a lot of it she gave or got other people to give, made sure it got here. She was assertive. She was said to have a voice like a bark. She was scary. Um, she kind of brooked no opposition. She has a younger husband, which I think is really interesting, and they lived in a hotel so she wouldn't have to cook or do any domestic work. And so she was kind of sort of exemplary in a kind of rather terrifying fashion of how one might deal with these kinds of problems. And she, um, I think one of the things that I love about her, I lo actually love her still lives and the way she brought Australian um, plant flowers into them. Grace Cossington Smith did too, they both did that. But I think one of the things that she really changed was the way we see the landscape. And she's very interesting, if you look, there's a series down there when she's, takes, she, she's one of the first, she went out into um, western New South Wales and went some way into the desert, not a lot. She was one of the first people who actually looked at and collected Aboriginal art and some Aboriginal artifacts, some of which she gave into the gallery here. And those, there's a number of them, I think th at least three down there, of which she was painting um, countries close by uh, Sydney, but in the kind of style and colours in a way of Aboriginal colours, in the dark ochres, broken up with dark lines, so there, but you can see that she's actually borrowing some of those ideas. Now today, we'd probably call that appropriation and she could be in trouble for it. But then, it was very radical to actually sort of take 
that seriously and to try and bring it into the way that kind of arts was seen. So I sort of feel that she's a figure that we owe a great deal to because she does change that way that we see. Um, Grace Cossington Smith did it rather differently. She didn't have the same kind of radicalism. She certainly wasn't assertive. She certainly wasn't assertive in that kind of a way that I think she was fairly formidable in personal ways. Um, and she is remarkable, and I think the reason I kind of always will love Grace Cossington Smith and her work and why she's been so important to me is she's the rare, rare, rare bird of a woman who creates, paints in her case, lives a creative life, painting seriously from over, over 60 years, very close to 60 years. So when she, her, the sock knitter was a student work it's extraordinary for in student work. Post-Impressionist, you can see the influence of Cezanne and Matisse there. You can see the way that she's kind of post-Impressionist in that she, she sort of solidified the central form and then the, the flattening of, of the background. Um, right the way through to her last great interiors when she was getting very ill and her sight was beginning to go in the early 70s when she was quite old and before she went into... Um, had to eventually stop painting and then eventually go into a home. But that is really an extraordinary, an extraordinary um, achievement. And well, I should say, an extraordinary career. And there are not a lot of women who have a career that continuous, that isn't broken up by all the things that break up women's careers so often. And the other thing that I love about her is she tries different things. She doesn't keep going in one direction, so she's moving. And there are times when it all goes a bit kind of flat and it all goes a bit muddy and it's sort of like nothing's happening and she persists and it starts up again. I just really greatly admire her for that. And she reminds me of... Um, a story, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Annie Dillard, who's an um, American writer who wrote a lovely little book called The Writing Life. And she was trying to say about what, it, what you have to do, the kind of sort of faith you have to have, the kind of ghastliness and wonder of, of a kind of a creative and artistic life. So she tells this story about having gone um, to do some writing on an island up in that, my geography is not very good, but it's up in that kind of northwest corner of the states where there are sort of seattle -y kind of region up there, Washington, higher, I think. And there are those big um, estuaries, rivers that come into the Pacific that they log inland and they float the logs down and um, at the port that when they get down to the bottom. So she's on an island in this sort of big estuarine thing and these logs are coming past. So somebody, um, one of her neighbours, always wanted one of these logs. They're fabulous logs. He wanted to make, I don't know what, something with this beautiful log. So he goes out, well, rows out, rows out to find one of these logs. They come down with a hook banged into the end so that they can be kind of collected. He puts it onto the back of his rowing boat and sets off rowing back towards the jetty, the pier where he left. But the tide has changed, so he keeps rowing forward and the boat keeps going back. And night falls and he's going back and he goes past the next island and he can see more lights and he keeps on going. But he keeps on rowing forward even though the, the boat's going back. And then eventually the tide turns and he um, keeps on rowing forward and eventually comes back in to the jetty just as dawn is breaking the next morning, his poor anxious wife standing there looking, waiting for him. Pity about the wife in that story, but it's a great story in a way that sort of metaphorically, sort of you have to keep on rowing forward even though the tide is going back. And you can see that happen to Gracie. You can see that happen to Grace Cossington Smith. Um, at various points, but actually mostly after, after the war, uh, after, yeah, after the Second War, when things changed again. But while she was still in her kind of that early modernist period, in that early period that this is about, her landscapes do something 
I think as important as um, Margaret Preston's landscapes, but in a very different kind of register. Another favorite uh, painting of mine is one called Trees, which she painted in 1927, I think. I think it was 1927. And it was of the trees at the back. She lived, as I said, in Taramara. There was a tennis court. Her studio was at the end of the tennis court. And then it went into the bush and some little kind of market gardens and things in that part of Taramara. And in trees, she said what she wanted to do in trees was to be able to paint at the same time a tree from every side and every angle. And when you look at trees, if you look carefully at the bottom, you can see the lines of the tennis court. And then you can see some of the kind of like cultivated bits. And then you see this wild burst of the most fabulous color and light. And she's showing you the trees from every side. But she's also showing you something about Australia and the Australian bush and the Australian light, which is right up against the suburbs that we're kind of living about, living in and amongst if we're there to see it. And another one of hers, which is fabulous, and I think next to it is one of waves. It's just called The Waves. And she painted it down at Sorul in 1931, or round about then, when her mother died. And what's so interesting about that is it isn't Australian in the sense of being specific. You can't recognize any specificity about it. It is of a wave. It's about kind of waveness and about energy and about rhythm, which is one of the words that many of these um, painters use all the time, the kind of rhythm of those waves. And it's got the most lovely kind of bruised color palette. And you sort of feel that she's doing something about, again, that sense of tide, that sense of this sort of great wash that holds all of us, that kind of, kind of sweeps in and sweeps out. And sometimes is, you know, the wave that comes over us that we have to sort of both accept and, and ride, I suppose, somehow how we do that. Um, she also painted, <coughs> famously, the bridge. And the bridge paintings down there are marvelous. Pre Margaret Preston, you will see, didn't do any. She loathed the bridge, thought it was totally kind of outdated and wasn't modern at all. Grace loved it, but she said she only loved it while the arms were coming to meet each other. And once it was finished, it felt really flat and a sort of anticlimax. Um, and I found that kind of interesting. And when you look at the paintings there, it's all about the curve, the sort of the curve, the line between the straight lines of the, that it's made out of, and then the curve, and also about this reach. And what is it that is so sort of enticing and always to artists, I think, about that reach of it coming together or not, um, the ambiguities we live with, how they can how they can marry or not marry, how they can sort of um, cleave together and how they push each other apart. And um, I think that they're very, I love those paintings, not only because they're redolent of Sydney and modern Sydney, and if you read the catalog and we look at the thing, there's enormous amounts about the urban, um, the urbanness, and we see the sort of city being created. And of course, these were urban women, even though they were painting going out, like Margaret Preston going out. Um, but it's not only because we see the urbanness, the modernity of Sydney, the bridge that we all know and drive over and is part of our lives living in this city, but the sense of that kind of reach, the connection, the meeting and the not meeting, the, the straddling and the not straddling, the two arms, the masculine, the feminine, the art, the life, however you want to put it. That painting was found by Daniel Thomas. I want to say a word about Daniel Thomas. He came here as a young curator at the end of the 50s. And there was not much in the way of an Australian and of an Australian um, uh, collection here. And he was one of the major collection collectors. And if you look at the dates of many of the works here, particularly the smaller ones, the woodcuts and so on, you'll see over and over again they were purchased in the late 60s or in the 60s or early 70s. They would have been Daniel's purchases. He found the bridge in curve, that fabulous one with the... Um, 
Archie is not quite meeting. He found that when he went up to visit Grace Cossington Smith in order to prepare to meet her and to work towards the first exhibition, big exhibition she had in 73, um, he found that down the back of a radiator in really bad condition. And he was persuaded by the conservators here to say it was too difficult to conserve. So it went to NGV in Victoria. And he says it's one of the few things he always regrets. But I think we all owe an enormous um, debt of gratitude to Daniel um, Thomas, as well as to these women, because he absolutely understood their value. He bought them. He made sure they came into this collection. He made sure they went to other, uh, went to other um, galleries as well. Uh, the sock knitter, I might say, wasn't, was found by Bernard Smith in the late, very late 50s, late in his research for his famous Australian painting. It was published in 1960. It had not been in a gallery. Um, and a lot of this ended, I've only got a couple of minutes, I just want to finally say, and I'm, is that we can never be too confident of the kind of advances in the way in which the work of women is seen, that it will be valued or that it will be, um, yeah, that it will be valued or will be even understood. A lot of this sort of period ended. Um, the anti-modernists who were very strong in the kind of art establishment said the most appalling things about some of these artists and you know, Grace Cotton Smith was told that some of hers were de uh, deliberately frightful, that she had painted freaks, that one of her landscapes looked like a whole lot of dead frogs. Um, and it was constantly, uh, well, not constantly, but it was often said, and I, I say often uh, advisedly, it was said, was said often, that modern art, particularly in the hands of women, could only result in some terrible, terrible outcomes, like free love and free verse. But the one that interests me, given that um, so often the kind of when women start to extend themselves into public discourse, it comes back to um, this sort of thing, companionate marriage. Now, I had to look up what companionate marriage was because I wasn't actually entirely sure. And I would hazard a guess that many of you in this room are actually indulged in this appalling form of social um, interaction that was so feared by the conservatives in the 30s. What a companionate marriage is, is one that will value the careers and the lives and the work of both parties to the marriage and will take as equal responsibility for um, making sure that both can have a career and both can have um, is part of, of the very beginning of saying that men could have some role in children as well. But it was particularly about women having a career and a life that could be supported by the marriage and be integrated into the family. So there you are. Be careful if you go down and look at this um, exhibition. You never know. You might come out being tempted towards a companion at marriage. I hope you enjoy it. The exhibition, that is. Not the marriage.